In 1966, American anthropologist Laura Bonan published an article titled Shakespeare in the Bush, in which she shared her experience of telling the story of Hamlet to the tribe in Nigeria. In doing so, she encountered quite many problems, from the beginning to the end. For instance, the idea of a ghost was totally absent in their culture, and therefore they considered the ghost of Hamlet's father as an omen sent by the witch. And this particular idea of which influenced their whole understanding of Hamlet. It happened simply because of the cultural differences. The societal conventions of them were not the same as that of Shakespeare, who created the character of the ghost of Hamlet's father and his audience who understands this ghost. We can also say that this is the structure in which the society thinks. And upon those wider structural elements, the interpretation of the text depends. To put it simply, this is what structuralism is all about. Hello and welcome to Literatious. I'm Yashpurohit, and in this video, I'm going to explain structuralism in the context of literary theory and criticism. And if such topics interest you, please consider subscribing to the channel. To understand structuralism, we have to travel to the 1916, when the course in general linguistics was first published. Based on the lectures given by Ferdinand de Saussure at the University of Geneva between 1906 and 1911, Saussure distinguishes between three French words or the universal concepts: language, long, and pro. Language is what we call language in English, which is the capacity of humans in general to speak their thoughts and feelings, and which distinguishes humans from the other animals. While long is the structure of an individual language, consists of vocabulary and the rules of grammar, it only exists in our heads and helps us in finding the meaning in what we read and hear. And lastly, parole is the act of an individual speech that unfolds in time. The word parole itself translates to speech in English. Therefore, long is the underlying structure of an individual language, which stays the same for all speakers of that language, while parole is the execution of it, and hence it varies between number of people. So, if we have to take Shakespeare for example, the famous soliloquy of Hamlet, to be and not to be that is the question. It can be written in many different ways. For instance, I may write, the question is whether to do it or not do it. The meaning essentially remains the same, and both are the instance of parole that follows the law. That is to say, the rules of English grammar. But if I had written, "It it whether do is question the not do or do," then all of a sudden it does not make sense anymore because it does not follow the rules of English grammar. The other thing that Saussure talks about is the arbitrariness of the language. So basically, if we think about any word. We can understand that there is no natural connection between the sound of the word and the meaning of the word. The sound of the word Saussure calls signifier, and the concept that it represents is signified. And the word is the sign that conveys the meaning. So there is nothing tree-like in the word tree. There is no connection whatsoever between the sign or the word tree and the concept of tree. But we still call this thing a tree because of the conventions of the English language. Therefore, Saussure concludes that the word and the meaning are arbitrary, and hence every language has a different word to represent this object. Furthermore, Saussure emphasized the synchronic study of language instead of diachronic linguistics, which was popular in the 19th century. The diachronic study is nothing but the historical and comparative study of language. While the synchronic study is the study of language at a particular point in time, usually the present time, the idea is to study the long of the language. That is to say, the underlying system of the language. To put it in the context of Indian students, when we study the English language, we don't study the evolution of language from Anglo-Saxon period to the 21st century. What we study is the grammar of the language, the system of the language. That is to say, the long of English. And by referring to the parole, mostly contemporary, we expand our vocabulary. Hence, understanding long is important for us to understand English. 
and that's what synchronic study is all about which socio emphasized and lastly socio explains the syntagmatic and paradigmatic relation of the language syntum is the linear relation of the words Take any sentence for instance. It makes sense mainly because of two things. Firstly, because it follows the rule subject plus verb plus object. And secondly, because the relationship that each of the word has with the other words in the sentence. While the paradigm is the vertical relationship between the words. The point that Saussure makes here is an important one. He says that the word does not make sense in isolation. It makes sense only in relation to the other words for example we can take two words house and hurt essentially they mean the same a place where we can live but still they are different a house is a typical example of a middle class dwelling place with few bedrooms and has a cooking and living area while hurt on the other hand is a small dwelling place constructed with local materials and has one room Now the meaning of both of these words are dependent on each other. A hut is a hut because it is not a house, a mansion or a palace. If we do not have the concept of a house, mansion or palace, then it would be difficult for us to understand the exact nature of the sign called hut. Similarly, we cannot have the concept of the day without the concept of the night or the notion of the good without the notion of the evil. and this is the reason why the tribal people of nigeria could not understand the concept of ghost they had the concept of witch omin and zombie but not of ghost and therefore they took the ghost of hamlet's father as an omin and zombie now these are the key elements of linguistics that school of structuralism is based upon and it has a wide application in cultural studies but as said earlier Right now we are particularly concerned with the literary application of structuralism which took academics by storm in the 1960s and 70s. And it owes so much to the anthropologist Claude Lévi-Strauss whose contribution to the school of structuralism is remarkable. For this video we are chiefly considering his 1955 essay The Structural Study of Myth. As a structural anthropologist, Levi Strauss believed that to understand the socio-cultural existence of humans, we have to look into the deep-seated grammar of the culture. And in the said essay, he tries to answer the similarities that can be found in the myths from different cultures which have no relation otherwise by stating that myth is a language and it consists of both long and prose. According to Levi Strauss, myth is a historical as well as a historical. That is to say, the narration of the myth always takes place hundreds of years ago, but at the same time, the story is everlasting. Therefore, the historical narration is the parole that varies from one storyteller to another. And the everlasting impact of the story is the long or the underlying structure of the myth. which always remains the same the substance of the myth is not the style in which the narrator tells the myth rather it is the long upon which the myth is based and therefore the myth has an amazing capability to survive all forms of transformation and to understand this substance we have to reduce the myth to its smallest component part which levi strauss calls mythemes which is nothing but an individual narrative or the event of the story in the essay levi strauss analyzed the oedipus myth and hence it is important to acquaint ourselves with the oedipus myth before diving into the structural analysis given by levi strauss so one day zeus had abducted europa the sister of cadmus and hence cadmus along with his men went in search of europa but could not find her Instead, he reached Delphi, where the oracle tells him that he would not be able to find Europa again, and hence, instead of wasting time on finding her, he should invest his time in finding a new city. So, Cadmus decides to perform some rituals to the goddess Athena, for which he sends his men to find some pure water. But his men never came back. So, Cadmus went in search of his men and finds out that they got killed by the dragon. and subsequently cadmus kills the dragon he then took out the dragon's teeth and planted them 
as a result of which a number of warriors raised from the ground, who were called Spartoi. These Spartoi started fighting with each other until only five of them remained, who then subjected themselves to Cadmus, and Cadmus found the city of Thebes. Lapticus was the grandson of Cadmus, and his son was Laios. Laios married Yakosta, and he became the king of Thebes. When Yakosta gave birth to the child, the oracle pronounced that Laios's son will kill him and marry his wife. Hence, Laios shackled the feet of the infant child and gave him away to the shepherd to have him killed by the natural forces. But shepherd instead adopted the child and gave him the name Oedipus. When Oedipus came of young age, he learned about the prophecy of the oracle at Delphi that he would kill his own father and would marry his own mother. And since Oedipus believed that the shepherd was his actual father, he decided to run away from the home to Thebes in order to escape the prophecy. While running away, he had a quarrel with a charioteer he encountered on the road and killed him. The charioteer was none other than Laios, Oedipus' actual biological father. So after killing his father unknowingly, Oedipus reached the city of Thebes where he encountered the Sphinx who was asking riddles to the people and if they failed to solve the riddle, the Sphinx would kill them. Oedipus manages to solve the riddle and kill the Sphinx and hence Oedipus became the savior of the Thebes and became the king of the city. And as a king, he married the reigning queen, Yakosta, his own mother, with whom he had two sons, Ethiocles and Polynices. Later it was found out that Oedipus has killed his father and married his mother and therefore he was thrown away from the city of Thebes and the throne was passed to his two sons. After a while the harmony between the two brothers broke and Ethiocles killed his brother Polynices. After the death of Polynices, it was decreed that whoever buries Polynices would be buried alive with the dead body of Polynices. However, Polynices' sister Antigone buried her brother and then committed suicide, so that she does not have to be buried alive. So this is the parole of the Oedipus myth, and to understand the structure of it, what Levi Strauss actually does is to reduce the myth to its smallest component parts, just like this. Each of these boxes represents one mythem, which is the smallest part of the myth. So, if we read these mythems horizontally from left to right, we will have the narration of the myth. But if we wish to understand the structure of the myth, then we have to read it vertically, from top to the bottom. And that's exactly what a structuralist critic does. When we analyze these columns one by one, we can notice the oppositional relationship between the columns 1 and 2 on the left and between column 3 and 4 on the right. So, all the mythems of the column 1 and 2 deals with the blood relations. Column 1 overemphasizes the blood relations, that is to say it supposes the idea of a close blood relationship. For instance, the grief that Cadmus feels for the loss of his sister. While column 2 is the exact opposite of it, which shows the underrating of the blood relations. For instance, Oedipus killing his own father. Now coming to the column 3, the mythems talks about the two monsters, the dragon and the sphinx. Levi Strauss describes them as Thonian beings, that is to say the creatures born from the earth. And since in the column 3 these creatures get killed, it implies the denial of the Thonic existence. While interestingly, the mythems of the column 4 are the name of the characters, and each of those names refers to the difficulty in walking. Now, in many cultures, it is believed that the humans are born from the earth and hence at the time of birth, they have a problem walking straight. Therefore, the last column asserts the thonic existence. So now, we have two sets of binary relations. The first two columns represent the overrating and underrating of the blood relations and the last two columns represent the denial and the assertion of thonic existence. But the question is, what exactly is the meaning of all this? Well, Levi Strauss argues that this binary opposition provides the primitive humans with a logical tool to articulate the origin of human life. The first notion is that humans came from the union of man and woman, while the second notion is that humans came out of the earth 
and therefore Levi-Strauss forms the binary opposition. So the column first asserts the birth through union and hence it denies the autochthonous origin, while the second column denies the birth through union and hence it asserts the autochthonous origin. And this is for Levi-Strauss the meaning of Oedipus myth at a deep level. This is the long of the Oedipus myth. In the essay, Levi-Strauss does the structural reading of other myths as well in a similar manner, but we are not going to touch on that right now, because essentially this is what a structuralist critic does to find the underlying meaning of the text. So in a nutshell, the structural critic tries to find the cultural components that influence the literal narrative, and that's where, according to the structuralist, the meaning of literary text lies.